So, Helen, very interesting that last year you did a TED talk in November and you were looking towards a situation where these new vaccines that were coming out at the time, you were predicting that they were going to get a, a bit of a bad rap from the anti-vaxxers and the, the vaccine hesitant. And it seems uh, that you, you had a good crystal ball at the time because pretty much that's come true. Uh, I, I think it's a bit of history repeating, and and I think it's a cycle that that we see uh, that that does repeat over and over again when we when we introduce a new vaccine. Of course, we're now seeing it on a mammoth scale. So a lot of the the countries they're showing uh, that they've got a lot of people who are now vaccinated, but they've still got rising rates of uh, of COVID. So how do these vaccines actually work? What are they meant to do? Well, primarily they're, they're meant to stop you getting sick and uh, going to hospital and, of course, uh, preventing preventing deaths. Um, and, and what they also do to a greater or lesser extent is prevent you from becoming infected and being able to transmit it. But when we talk about countries that have got high vaccine coverage now, it's, it's all relative. It's, it's actually nowhere near high enough. To, to stop a lot of disease circulating. And it's only certain sectors of the population that have um, been highly vaccinated, like, for example, the elderly in the UK. So w- w- the vaccines all work in slightly different ways, but the intention of all the vaccines, I understand, is to basically prevent you from getting seriously ill. But you can still catch COVID if you've been vaccinated? Indeed, you can. And depending on the vaccine and depending on the variant, um, you you could be quite well protected against becoming infected at all or or not so well. And and I think that that sort of changes quite rapidly as we we see these new variants. But um, I think we were seeing some of the mRNA vaccines being able to to prevent transmission or infection and transmission in the orders of of sort of 80%. So so that's that's actually pretty good. So if if I've been fully vaccinated, I could still catch COVID. I could still pass it on to somebody else. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a magic bullet. And no vaccine is. And there are always some people that will not be protected. And it, it, what we're seeing is that even with these variants, the vaccines are still pretty good at preventing severe disease, you know, hospitalizations and death. But as we move down the, the severity, um, we're seeing perhaps um, a reduced effectiveness. Um, so I guess at the moment, we're still holding quite well for, for those, um, I guess, the burden on hospitals, of course, deaths and things like that. Um, but it is a moving fest. It's changing all the time. So the, a lot of people who call themselves the vaccine hesitant, what are their main problems? What are they worried about? I mean, there was the... Uh, the, the thing about the autism, I think that's sort of been thrown in the bin now and debunked, but what is their main resistance to getting vaccinated? It usually comes down, I guess, the main reason is concerns about, about safety uh, and, and I guess um, the idea that the risks from the vaccine uh, are greater than the risks posed by, by the disease. So it really comes down to a sort of a fundamental risk-benefit um, and, um, analysis in people's minds. One interesting dynamic uh, associate professor about this particular virus is that it's no virus in history has ever been uh, so followed, so counted, so uh, linked to data. And people can sort of twist that data any way they, they like. Do you think the amount of publicity and the amount of data that's been publicised has worked for the scientists or against them? Oh, both. <laughs> yeah. It's been uh, it, 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 an infodemic in terms of the, the amount of information and um, the, the speed at which it, it's produced and published. But also, um, along with that, we have the misinfodemic where, where some of the, as you say, is becoming twisted. And uh, unfortunately, I guess what we have today that we didn't have um in the past, it, it, it platforms uh, for this misinformation to be disseminated quite easily. So what do you, as a, as a scientist, what do you do when you're on calls like this, and I'm sure you do it quite often, what do you say to people when they start throwing these questions at you and uh, the conspiracy theories at you? How do the scientists sort of battle back to try and win this info war? 
I think we struggle. I think it's really hard because there's there's no one one way or one conversation that you can have that's going to, uh, I, I guess, work for everybody. Some people, people, even though their ultimate decision is perhaps that they don't want to have the vaccine, Seen, uh, that, that that's for very different reasons, and so um, we can we can help address the misinformation. We can give more information, for example, you know, f- fill the knowledge gap. We can correct information that's wrong, which is really important. Correcting the misinformation, but um, that that's going to work for some people, but that's not going to work for everybody. Um, and then you start getting into to, to needing different ways to communicate, but also the establishment of trust. And um, I think at the core of it is, is um, and you see a lot of the problems coming with that, people don't trust, uh, I guess, the messenger, the people with the messages. And if, if the messages are only coming from government or the messages are only coming from uh, perhaps scientists that people don't trust, then, then that's not going to resonate. So you're going to have to adapt the messenger as well as the messages. Persist, persist, persist. And don't let up. (laughs) Helen, uh, without sort of going through the top 10 vaccines, um, can we just talk about a bit of the difference between, say, these mRNA vaccines and some of the older style vaccines like uh, AstraZeneca and uh, Sinovac, Sinopharm, which come from China? Uh, What is the key difference with these mRNA vaccines and, and why are they more effective? I guess the... They're the newest kids on the block. I think the the platforms that are used by, for example, AstraZeneca uh, and the Janssen vaccines, they're um, they're also pretty recent. Those the developments in those viral vector platforms, and then um, and then we have all the other kind of approaches, the the more traditional approaches um, as well. So the the thing that sets, uh, I guess, the these both of them really apart is that uh, they get your body to make the vaccine itself as opposed to actually introducing the the part um, of the fragment of the say the virus or something that your body responds to in this case they're just sending they're sending in the instructions and you make it yourself and I think um, what this enables is um, actually a very very nice immune response uh, and it can um, allow developers to, to create these vaccines that push all the right buttons that are going to get the, an immune response that's going to be optimised for this particular, in this case, this particular coronavirus. So with the mRNA vaccines, are we injecting nanobots that uh, Bill Gates is going to track? I can't no, believe I'm you know, asking that are, question. Those are way too big, way too big to fit into the needle. I can tell you, you need a much bigger needle to get little little nanobots in it. Sure. Um, no, <laughs> it's actually, um, I guess, in a way, uh, one of the purest vaccines in the sense that you're getting a, 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 a nano, I mean, they're nanoparticles, but they're just little tiny spheres of uh of fat or lipid, and inside there are the instructions, which is just a little tiny piece of um, a nucleic acid or messenger RNA. Uh, I suppose the thing that uh, really categorises these mRNA vaccines to send around the world is that they seem to be need to, needed to be transported at such cold temperatures. It does make that a little bit more complicated. But uh, so far, they seem to be showing very high efficacy rates. It's remarkable. I, I guess they were the first cabs off the rank and uh, they set a very, very high bar. I mean, those initial studies indicated 95% um, yeah. efficacy against uh, against um, against the disease. That's remarkable. And it also makes it a pretty tough act to follow. Um, I guess the expectations were not that high. <laughs> so sure. um, they're they're. They're quite something, um, but and also I think um, over the last you know few months we've seen those requirements for storage ease a little bit as uh, Moore's learned about their stability. So we have a little bit more room, um, I guess, to work with them. New Zealand and Australia seem to have coped with the situation very well. Why do you think that is? I think uh, I, I think actually we took a leaf out of uh, out of the books from the Asian countries uh, that have experienced uh, diseases like uh, like SARS, uh, and actually res- have in the past responded very well to these things. And uh, we we 
took an approach of, of really not tolerating the virus at all. So there was uh, not so much flattening the curve, but actually eliminating it altogether. So we it really um, shut our borders. We're, we're really island nations. We were able to shut our borders and keep it out. Uh, and we've learned a lot in the process and got a bit better at it. And we, we're still, you know, we're still um, sitting tight here. Basically closing the borders. Were you surprised in the early days uh, when the Southeast Asian countries also performed very well? I mean, certainly here in Thailand, I was thinking, oh, here we go. Uh, we're going to see a, a big rush of cases. Happened in India. Uh, it's sort of happening in Indonesia to an extent. And now also seems to be happening in Thailand. But why did the Southeast Asian countries do so well early on in the pandemic? I think they've got perhaps more of a culture of... Um, of some of those like masking and social yeah. distancing yeah. Uh, uh, policies and things like that. So I think, and also um, perhaps um, the people being prepared to do as they've been asked and not so much rebelling against it. But over time, I think we, we start to see probably some fatigue there. Um, but also we're not talking about the same variants that we were back then. We're now talking right. about a variants that are, far more uh, infectious and I guess um, what was working last year might not be um, able to keep it down um, this year. So let's have a talk about this Delta variant. Why is it different and why is it dangerous? Its um, ability, if we, if we look back to, to the variant that, 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 that arose in, in Wuhan, we're talking about something that um, a, one infectious person might infect a further uh, two to three people, um, and and that's changed. And we're now talking about a variant that can infect five to eight people. And it might not sound like a lot, but actually um, that can spell a lot of trouble. That's actually a highly infectious disease now. So those things like masking and, and some of that distancing and all of those things just might not be enough anymore. So the next step I suppose we need to be concerned about is we've got the Delta variant, uh assumedly down the track we could have an epsilon variant we have no idea what that may or may not do it might be more dangerous we have an we have an epsilon oh okay <laughs> and it's i'm behind and, <laughs> and at some point we'll run out of the uh, letters of the greek alphabet there's only 24 of them so um it, it, it's absolutely vital that we can dampen this down globally as fast as possible or we are going to are going to keep seeing these variants arise so dampened down means lockdowns. I mean, we're sort of in the situation that we were back with the Spanish flu. Wear masks, socially distance, wash your hands and uh, lock down. Um, I think there's going to be a balance somewhere where, we, where you get to a point where you achieve enough uh, immunity in your community, um, primarily through vaccination. Yes. Uh, that you can start easing those because you, you, you'll be at a point where you can actually tolerate the, the you know a, a certain amount of the disease, and uh, when it's been dampened to that extent, it, there's not you know the, the, the human incubators where the variants uh, arise are much fewer, and so we, we, the, the chances of that happening are much much lower. So at the moment where there's where there's so much disease, we're just going to keep seeing uh, the variants pop up. It's just it's a numbers game. 